the National World War II Museum, we mean it thanks to all of you for your, for your service to the country. Now, one final special shout out this evening goes to Ken Chenault, the grandson of General Claire Chenault, uh, who drove here all the way from Vicksburg, Mississippi tonight, am I correct? To, to hear tonight's program. So Ken, if you would please stand and be recognized. Ken Chenault. And finally, in our recognitions, uh, we have tonight in attendance uh, members of our Student Leadership Academy who are here in New Orleans for, the, for a very special summer program. Give us a wave, gang. You're out there. Thank you. Great. Great. I almost feel like asking everyone else in the audience to stand up and be recognized just to get it all. So we, we're, we're, all, we're all above average here at the museum. Um, it's great. Thanks to everyone for coming. We're really, really a great crowd tonight, and we're really pleased by it. I know our speaker is too. Now to tonight's program. It seems to me to be perfectly timed. Uh, since it ties into so many of the museum exhibitions that we currently have on display. Our last two major permanent exhibitions we've opened, The Road to Tokyo, which deals with the Pacific War, The Arsenal of Democracy, which just opened and deals with the home front and the road by which America came into World War II. But also, tonight's speaker keys in to our next special exhibition, which is opening next week, on Louisiana's role in World War II, The Pelican State Goes to War. I think the opening is next Thursday, so that's coming up soon. And in some way, tonight's, uh, uh, tonight's speaker hits, you know, just hits all those buttons. The subject of tonight's book, The Shadow Tiger, is William McDonald Jr., the, the wingman to Louisiana's own Claire Chenault. And tonight, we're going to be privileged to hear from William Jr.'s son, author William McDonald uh, III. His daughter, Maggie, has also accompanied him uh, tonight, this evening, so we're happy about that as well. Now, Billy McDonald worked nearly six years on this book, and I do know how a book can get into your soul, and you think about it when you go to bed, and you think about it when you wake up in the morning, and all points in between. Now, he's produced not only a wonderful homage to his father, and I, I, I read the book just last night, so I'm speaking from a real fresh read, but also what I thought was a tremendous story of America in the 30s and on into World War II. Uh, it weaves together historical narrative in a very skillful way with his father's personal photos and correspondence. And uh, it's just lucky that the family keeps these things all, all these years. And, and all of us should remember those treasures that might be in our attic right now having to do with loved ones who performed service in World War II. So here to tell us tonight the exciting story of Claire Chenault's wingman, the Shadow Tiger, is Billy McDonald III. Billy, please join me up on stage. Um, well, uh, normally, this would be your advance. That's your laser point up top, back, and okay. So how am I gonna think? Is it, huh? I think it's, here we go. Okay. okay, thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm a little overwhelmed overwhelmed by such a large, large crowd, but I'm delighted that y'all are here. There is one passage, oops, okay. There is one passage out of the book that I don't think I'm gonna be able to see on that screen over there and read with my eyesight, so I, I brought a book so I could read it. Um, but I wanna thank a couple of people. Uh, one would be my wife, Nancy, who is not here. She is in Atlanta uh, watching, hi, Nancy. Uh, she, is, uh, she is taking care of our grandson, Andy, and couldn't be here. Um, and I would uh, also like to thank my daughter, Maggie, who is a YWCA executive in Birmingham and was kind enough to not trust me to drive down here by myself, so she drove me down here. Um, and then I would like to thank uh, Barbara Evenson, who was my co-writer on the book and my editor, and she came to our home in Birmingham and lived with us for one year, one entire year, uh, to edit this book and uh, also to co-write it and an extraordinarily talented person. And as the person who writes the check for the book, I can tell you that because of Barbara, I got more than my money's worth out of the book. And she's working with a New Orleans author now on, a, on another book on Chenault, which will be very exciting and will probably take another year to come out. Uh, but I wanted to recognize those people. Now, I'd like to get into the story if I can figure out how to punch the buttons here, so bear with me. 
Mac's next door neighbor was World War I ace Jimmy Meisner. He created a desire to fly in Mac and took Mac on his first airplane ride at the age of 14, and Mac was hooked. He, uh, in 1930, H.L. Black, junior senator from Alabama, future Supreme Court judge, nominated McDonald for flight school in Brooksville in Texas, and his last check ride was with First Lieutenant Claire Lee Chennault, and it was the beginning of a friendship that would last a lifetime. From there, McDonald was sent to Selfridge Field in Michigan and studied high altitude flying, navigation, and how to fly a tri-motor Ford. All of those skills would come in very handy when he got to China. He was released from uh, his military contract as a reserve second lieutenant in mid-32. He looked for four months for a job in the civilian aviation industry, couldn't find one. And in December of 32, he went by Maxwell Field in Montgomery uh, to see Luke Williamson, who's in the bottom picture, the man on the right, uh, who's an old friend from Brooksfield. And he reintroduced him to uh, then Captain Chenault, who's in the middle of that picture. Um, and Chenault had just been named the head of the three men on the flying trapeze, which was the Army Air Corps' first acrobatic team. And he told McDonald, he said that Lieutenant Hansel is leaving to go into the bomber wing, and I need a replacement pilot, and if you want the job, it's yours. And McDonald jumped at the job and enlisted on the spot as a buck private making $17 a month with a bunk under the headquarters building. It took them four months to train him to join the team. Once he was trained, the team performed 50 shows in the next three years and were seen by approximately one million people. Did I miss one? I did miss one. Okay, that's supposed to play. So who's my electrician? Chenault was a fullback to the dashing pilots of the First World War. During the 1930s, he had been the leader of a popular flying team in the United States Army Air Corps. They called themselves the three men on the flying trapeze. The daredevil stunts of the flying trapeze were proof to Chenault that fighter planes could engage in combat in close formation through the most violent of maneuvers. But the high command of the Army Air Corps believed that a new generation of bombers had made fighter planes obsolete, a novelty to amuse the public, but useless in modern warfare. After years of ridicule at the hands of his superiors, Chenault continued to argue his case for pursuit planes through 1936. Now, that 38 seconds of film that you saw is off of a film called Fei Hu, F-E-I, and the second word is H-U, and you can buy it on the ABG website or, or, or contact Lydia Rossi on the ABG website, and it's one of the best ABG histories that you'll ever see in, in a film, and I recommend it. This is the last formal picture taken of the men on the flying trapeze. They are winners of the 1935 Miami Air Races. Uh, McDonald's on the left, Schnault is in the middle, Williamson's on the right. Uh, they were seen by a Chinese delegation of pilots who offered them lucrative contracts to go to China to train Chinese fighter pilots. Chenault declined for the three pilots, but asked the Chinese to keep the offer open until he got the results back from the second lieutenant's exam that Sergeant McDonald and Sergeant Williamson had taken along with eight others at Maxwell Air Force Base. When the test results came back, you guessed it, the two that failed were McDonald and Williamson. Chenault took it as a personal insult and wrote a scathing op-ed in the Montgomery Advertiser and came back and told Chenault and Williamson, I mean, Chenault and McDo I mean, Williamson and McDonald to go to China and that thing, he didn't think things were going to go well for him, and if they didn't, he would be about a year behind them. Um, McDonald and Williamson bought out their enlistments for $89.60 apiece. Uh, they went to Washington and collected $500 apiece from the Chinese embassy. They made their way across the United States to Vancouver, Canada. They got on board the Empress of Russia that was a Canadian ship. And there were two, uh, and, and they, all the other personnel Chenault wanted to go to China were on board, and the two most important were C.B. Smith from Montgomery, who was Chenault's mechanical genius, 
and he was truly a me me mechanical genius, and his armament specialist, Ralph Watson. When they got to China, they went to Hang Chow and then went to the uh, Central Aviation School, and they were met by uh, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, who was head of the Aeronautical Commission, and she told them that you've got one year to work with these men, and there's a great deal expected of your work. Um, that is the 1936 Hankow advanced training class, and most of the pilots in that picture would be dead within the first year of the war. And the reason being is they had 91 combat-ready aircraft, and the ja Japanese that they were fighting had between 500 and 700 combat-ready aircraft, so it was sort of a mismatch from the word go. This is a 2010 CIA report uh, of uh, on McDonald being sent by Madame Chiang Kai-shek on a spy mission into China. Uh, he was given a different uh, uh, passport, a different name, uh, and his cover story was that he was manager of an entertainment group of 42 entertainers uh, going into Japan, and when he got past the immigration officials, he jumped a train and went to Yokohama, got on the USS Garfield, and picked up Colonel Chenault, uh, they got off and rented an open car or what we would call a convertible. And the article goes on to say that they had, uh, like two young operatives, they had an unhealthy appetite for getting too close to airfields and harbor installations. And they drove for three days back to Kobe, Japan, where McDonald had entered and where the USS Garfield had moved uh, uh, to meet them. I mean, the, there was, you entered Japan in stages coming down the coast at different uh, uh, harbors. Um, the, the Garfield made its way up the coast and they took more pictures of very large industrial complexes being built on the water's edge as though it were a country getting ready to go to war, which Japan obviously was. And then they turned due west and went to China. This is an interesting ship. This is the Izumo. This is a light Japanese cruiser it is the headquarters for the Japanese Imperial Forces in China. It is moored in Shanghai Bay. You can see a beautiful picture of Shanghai Bay in the background. Um, and uh, Captain Chuck Sharp of China National Aviation Corporation uh, climbed up on top of the bank building uh, uh, in uh, Shanghai to see what was going on. And the, the Sino-Japanese War started with the Marco Polo Bridge incident on July the 7th in, uh, uh, near Peking, and then this ship on August the 13th began shelling the Shanghai Civic Center, and Captain Sharp uh, was on top of the bank building on the 14th and looked down the river, and there were three Hawk Three fighter planes coming down the river headed toward the Azumo. And Captain Sharp was a pretty sharp guy and said that uh, those three Chinese planes that were biplanes, but the best that the Chinese had, are in suspiciously close formation. And the, all three planes went in and made dive bombing attacks on the Zumo. And according to Sharp, and we have the documents to back it up, that their bombs just barely missed the Zumo. If any one of their bombs had hit the Zumo, it would have sunk. They came back and made two strafing runs, each on the Azumo, and then flew off. Captain Sharp got down off the Azumo and would later confront Chenault, McDonald, and Williamson and asked, uh, is the rumor true that you were paid $1,000 apiece to attack the Azumo? And they would neither confirm or deny the report. When I was in China in 2016 and spoke to the Kunming Aviation Association, um, I had a two-star retired general came up to me and confirmed that, that story was absolutely accurate. At this point, the Japanese ambassador took a picture of McDonald and a picture of Chenault and took it to the American ambassador and said, these two pilots are in violation of the United States Neutrality Act, and uh, you need to run them out of China, and, and they are, they are uh, clearly in violation of that uh, American law. Ambassador Johnson had no choice, so he went to see Chenault and McDonnell and told them that they were subject to uh, two years in jail, a $2,000 fine, and loss of citizenship if, the, if they did not leave, to which Chenault said, well, I guess that means I'm Chinese. 
Um, McDonald wrote a letter home to his parents and said, I will not leave the Chinese people at the one moment in history that they need me the most. Um, this is a special aircraft. This is under Schnault's contract. He had the Chinese agree to buy him the aircraft of his choice. This is a P-36 prototype. Uh, it was referred to as the Hawk 75 Special. It is an unarmed reconnaissance plane, and Chenault referred to it as a neutral fighter plane, as if there was such an animal. And uh, he had all of the weight stripped out of this plane, including the radio, and he couldn't hear very well, so he certainly didn't need a radio. Um, and it became the fastest flying plane in China and the highest flying plane in China. And he would fly the plane up around McDonald's squadron when they were in combat against the Japanese, and make notes in his notebook on how the Japanese pilots were trained, uh, their strength and weaknesses, and the strength and weaknesses of the Japanese airplanes. And on one of these trips, one of the Japanese pilots had the temerity to take a shot at Chenault, and he took great, great umbrage to that event and landed and told the mechanics that the next SOB that shoots at me, I'm gonna shoot back, and I want some guns put on this plane, and I want them put on this plane right now. And two days later, they had guns on the plane, and the first person that took the plane up to test was McDonald, and he, flew, he landed a few minutes later with bullet holes in the tail of the plane and reported that three guns wouldn't fire and one gun had, was partially empty, and it would be a really great idea if they got all four guns working before they sent the colonel up in that plane. This is a picture of Chenault and McDonald on the right and the Hawk 75 in the background at the same aerodrome at uh, the base of Purple Mountain in Nanking. And McDonald had a couple of jobs at this uh, aerodrome, one of which was every time there was an air raid, his job was to take the Hawk 75 and fly it out of danger. And the uh, aerodrome had air raids 66 days in a row and more than one air raid on more than one occasion. And we made a rough calculation, and it is a calculation, it's not an exact number, that he had 112 encounters with armed Japanese airplanes over Nanking. And he found one uh, carrier, the Rujo, and had his uh, squadron go and attack the Rujo. And they came very close to sinking it, but did not, but they did cause it to move. And he also found the Japanese carrier Kaga uh, that was sunk at Midway. Um, Chenault and McDonald both had bounties on their head from the Japanese, and they had two squadrons of uh, planes in Shanghai that had one job, and that was to shoot down the Hawk 75, so they must have been doing some sort of damage. Now, I'm going to have to read this out of here because my vision's not good enough to read that over there. Um, but this is from the British Archives, uh, British Naval Attaché Robert Aikens Intelligence Report dated March the 7th, 1939. That night I had dinner with Colonel Chenault and an American instructor named McDonald. The latter is credited with having brought down a large number of Japanese, but he was reluctant to talk about his combat activities. The story for what it's worth is that he was paid so much per hostile aircraft crashed he was making so much that the Japanese reduced the payment to $1,000 per plane in gold when McDonald said that on those terms they could go and shoot the blankety things down themselves. <laughs> and you have to wonder if they cut him to $1,000 per plane, what in the world were they paying him before? Now, one of the other things they did at this aerodrome is they would occasionally, after they got their flights off, they would walk across Nanking Country Club and they would play two holes of golf while they were waiting for their planes to come back. Um, and uh, then they would walk up, the, up to the clubhouse where they were roommates at Nanking Clubhouse and they would play vigorous games of ping pong at night. And, uh, they would play C.B. Smith and Harry Sutter, the Swiss radio specialist, and after a particularly vigorous ping pong came one night, Chenault came down and said, I got a hell of an idea. Why don't we get 100 American pilots and 100 American planes and properly train them and we can kick the stuffings out of the Japanese. 
This is the December of 1937, and it's the first mention of the American Volunteer Group or the Flying Tigers. So if there's any doubt about who invented the Flying Tigers, it was Claire Lee Chenault, and it was not anybody else. Now, Chenault uh, and McDonald uh, were run out of Nanking when Nanking fell and went to Hangkow, 150 miles west, and subsequently they went 1,000 miles west to uh, Kunming, and the government went from Hangkow to Chongqing, also 1,000 miles west, and what they were trying to do is get out of carrier aircraft range, so they want to be not reachable from Japanese aircraft carrier airplanes. McDonald had estimated that it would take two years to train a Chinese pilot from scratch to be a competent fighter pilot. So in 1940, the Chinese pilots were holding their own against the Japanese uh, uh, over Chongqing when they introduced the Zero for the first time. The Zeros came in and shot down all 27 Chinese planes in one battle, and the entire Chinese Air Force was effectively done. Um, and the uh, McDonald was out of a job and Chenault was out of a job and the Chinese Air Force was in serious trouble. Chenault made plans to go back to the United States as quickly as he could to try to put a fire under the people that were working on the AVG. Um, and he realized that if he came back with 100 pilots and 100 planes or three squadrons that he would need a ground transportation to move the ground crews from air base to air base. Um, and if he didn't, and they were only located at one bear air base, the uh, Japanese would simply zero in on that air base and destroy them, overwhelm them with bombs and airplanes. So for that purpose, he picked China National Aviation Corporation, which was 45% 40, owned by Pan American, 55% owned by uh, the Chinese government. They had nine airplanes and nine pilots. They were based in Hong Kong, a British colony. They were surrounded by the Japanese. They are the only airline in history to ever take off at night. They are the only airline in history to ever have a published uh, schedule in a war zone, if you can imagine. Um, they are the only airline in history to cancel a flight due to excessive moonlight. Um, and Captain McDonald negotiated a very attractive deal for himself. He got a triple in pay and um, because this was a fairly dangerous job find for this airline, and he got an option to where he could go back to Pan American and be a captain at the t any time that he chose to go, and he could skip the first five years of seniority requirement, and he called it a job with a future, and it was an option that he was very proud of, and he wasn't going to let go of it very easily. And here's another picture of the landing strip in, in uh, Kunming. You can look at the at the landing strip on the sandbar in the middle of the river. And if you look closely enough, you can see the wires coming over that they had to fly over. And when you flew over those wires, you make a, had to make a dive to get to the runway. So it was an extremely dangerous place to land. The guy in the picture is Ned Jones from Birmingham, who was kind enough to introduce my parents before they got married. And when Chenault came back from the United States, he immediately went, first person he saw was Mac and he named him the first chief of staff of the AVG. And McDonald agreed to accept the position provided he could get a leave of absence from CNAC and a leave of absence from Pan American. And he went to both, air, both entities and asked them if he could get a leave of absence and they said no. Um, so he did not get to go with AVG at that point. And this is a picture of Chongqing Airport here. McDonald also made it into the comic strips. This is Terry and the Pirates, written by Milton Kniff. Uh, Kniff was a drinking buddy of Frank Higgs, who was McDonald's roommate uh, in Hong Kong. Um, Higgs was in the comic strip as Dude Hennig, and McDonald is the only person to ever be in the comic strip and play himself. He was Captain Mack. Um, and Kniff was censured, and one day he's working on his cartoons, and the FBI shows up with guns and machine guns and they come in and say, you have put classified information in this comic strip and it's being seen by 31 million people a week in the United States and we want to know where you're getting your information and he had a hard time convincing him that he was getting them from a drinking buddy from Ohio State. Um, but finally the FBI backed off. You can still buy these comic strips on Amazon in coffee table book form and they're still fun to read. 
This was a flight McDonald had that was interesting. He flew out of Hong Kong to Kunming. He had $10 million in gold bearer bonds on the plane. He was trying to get away from where he thought there were some Japanese fighter planes, and he flew into a thunderstorm, and his uh, radio operator didn't roll the antenna in quite quickly enough, and they were struck three times by lightning. It burned up all the electronics in the plane, and the plane was definitely going down. The co-pilot panicked, had to be pulled out of the seat by the radio operator. Re he was replaced by the radio operator, and they broke through the clouds, and lo and behold, there was a road being built by a thousand Chinese coolies. It was a mud road, but it would do very nicely. And he'd landed with, and I mean this literally, there were two inches on each side of the wheels when he finished his rollout. And the wheels picked up a lot of mud and a lot of weight, and that along with the engines caused the nose to go nose down and tail up. The co-pilot got out of the plane and was last seen running northeast in Sichuan Province, China. <laughs> on December the 6th, 1937, McDonald wrote a letter home to his parents and said the Japanese will attack the Hawaiian Islands. He, along with five and a half million Chinese, knew that the Japanese were going to attack the Hawaiian Islands. They just didn't know when. And the only people that didn't know the Hawaiian Islands were going to get attacked were the Americans in the Hawaiian Islands. On December 7th and 8th, being the same day due to the international dateline in 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and they also attacked Hong Kong. Uh, in Hong Kong, they blew up the Pan American Clipper that was moored next to the runway, and they blew up all of the CNAC planes on the runway. McDonald had the only plane outside of Hong Kong. He was in Rangoon with a load of passengers, and he had a very important decision to make. Did he fly to Chongqing as called for on the schedule, or since he was already in Burma and not that far from Tangu, Burma, which was a British base where Chenault was training the Flying Tigers, he decided to fly to Tongu, and he landed in Tongu in between 66 P-40s with 66 angry Americans sitting in the seats with engines running ready to repel an expected attack from the Japanese. He pulled his plane over, left the engine running, jumped out, ran across the field. Chenault was running the other way. They met in the middle of the field, and they talked for about five minutes. And there is no record that I could find anywhere of what they talked about for those five minutes. He got back on his plane. He flew to Chongqing. He talked to the Chongqing station manager who told him that they could not get Hong Kong on the radio and that he probably had the only CNAC plane left in existence and under no circumstances was he to fly to Hong Kong. He thanked the station manager, slammed the door, took off for Hong Kong and landed at one o'clock in the morning uh, in a blacked out city and they flickered the landing lights just before his wheels touched the ground and he was delighted to find that all the CNAC personnel were fine and the five planes that they had in the hangars were out and they were getting ready to service in it and they were hoping to evacuate 275 people out of Hong Kong. Uh, they loaded McDonald's plane with the Chinese currency board and other high Chinese officials. He was supposed to take off at two o'clock at 1.30, a warning came in from the Japanese, and they said that any pilot who takes off from this base will have his head cut off as he is captured. So at 2 o'clock, McDonald took off and for, for Calcutta, I mean for uh, Chongqing, and landed in Chongqing, got about three hours sleep, um, flew back to Hong Kong, and helped participate in four days of evacuating 275 people. Now, the last flight out of Hong Kong was flown by Captain... Chuck Sharp, who was the chief pilot, and McDonnell. It was a DC-2. It was rated to carry 22 people. It had 74 people on the plane when it went down the runway. As it was going down the runway, they could hear Japanese gunfire in the background. When the plane ran off the end of the runway, it didn't go up, it went down. And it was heading toward the water, and the ground effect kicked into play just before it hit the water, and it began to claw its way back up in the air and they made it back to Chongqing, and they released 74 extremely happy passengers, uh, glad to be back in Chongqing. When they got back to Chongqing, they loaded on his plane. They refueled it and loaded it with all of the CNAC personnel, including Mr. Bond, who was the vice president with Pan American. And they had the brain trust of CNAC on the plane, and they discussed the future plans with CNAC on the flight to Calcutta. 
and they decided that what they were going to do is fly gasoline and gunpowder over the Himalayan mountains into Kunming and then fly tungsten back over the Himalayan mountains on the way back. When they explained this to the British, the British thought they were kind of nuts but thought it was a really great idea and gave them everything that they needed. At that point, uh, after two days, McDonnell asked for uh, three airplanes and two volunteers, and Captain Higgs and Captain Ingalls, uh, uh, Ingle volunteered, and they went on a rescue mission. They went to Tongu, and they picked up General Chenault, or Colonel Chenault, and picked up two squadrons, the first and second squadrons of the ABG, uh, their ground crews and all of their equipment, and they left the third squadron behind, and they wanted to stay behind and help the British try to fend off a very vicious attack from the Japanese. They flew into Kunming at uh, early in the morning, right before the sun came up, and then uh, later in the day, the P-40s flew in. Now, on, on December the 20th, the um, uh, Japanese flew over Kunming uh, in a bombing raid with 11 Japanese bombers, and out of the sun came the Flying Tigers, and they shot down four of the 11 planes on the first pass, and the other seven planes were chased off, and only one of those bombers made it back to the Japanese base. And this is a very important time for in the war. And think about this, we're not even th a month into the war at this point, and, and the Flying Tigers has their first offensive base of operations in China, and this was a really big deal for them, and it would come in very handy very shortly. This is a picture of the Kunming Aviation Museum, and if you look over my head, you will see the Japanese High Command standing on top of a mountain overlooking the Salween River Gorge Bridge, which is the picture in the middle, and I was really lucky. I got the really cute uh, translator. Um, and on the bridge are the Japanese Special Forces trying to sneak their way from Burma into China and Tex Hill and the Flying Tigers come along and they shoot down that bridge. And when they come back the next day, they built a pontoon bridge and Tex Hill blows up that bridge. And when they come back the third day, they're gone. There are no Japanese. Now what's really important about this is that the plan that the Japanese had was had they crossed that bridge, they would have taken Kunming, they would have taken Chongqing, China would have been out of the war. Their plan called for them to try to conscript uh, between three and five million Chinese troops to help the Japanese fight against the Allies in the Pacific. That, along with the one million Japanese troops that would have been freed up to fight the Allies in the Pacific had China not been in the war, um, had the Allies in the Pacific stretched as thin as they were, had to face an additional six million troops, the outcome of the Pacific War probably would have been uh, quite different from how it came out. So this was an important turn in history and the war wasn't even one month old. Now McDonald went back to his uh, current day job which was flying gasoline and gunpowder over the northern route of the Himalayas which was over 22,000 foot mountains from uh, Calcutta to Kunming and then he would fly tungsten on the way back and then they would also fly on the southern route from Dinjan uh, over a 20,000 foot mountain and fly to Kunming and get tungsten and fly it on the way back. And CNAC lost 88 airplanes in four years. And the Air Transport Command of the United States Army started in the latter part of 1943. And in, in their time in flying over the hump, they lost 500 planes and 1,600 men. But they did keep China in the war. This is my mother and father uh, on their honeymoon. They got married in Calcutta. Uh, her name was Peggy Spain from Birmingham, and my father was Birmingham, from Birmingham, and they went to, Cal to Kashmir on their honeymoon. And then they went on a tiger hunt on the back of elephants. Uh, and my father is smiling because he's just shot his first tiger. You can see the shotgun there in the basket. And my mother is in serious need of a drink. Um, and my sister Cameron was uh, born in Shanghai on January the 8th, 1947, and her godfather was General Chenault, and her godmother was Madame Chiang Kai-shek. On August the 1st, 1947, the communists are coming right around the corner, and Mac finally concludes, reaches the conclusion that it's time to leave China. 
and it's not a great place to raise a brand new baby girl. So he comes back to the United States. In 1958, Chenault called Daddy up and he and Mother went to his home in Waterproof, Louisiana and spent about 10 days with him and they planned his funeral at Arlington Cemetery and Daddy was one of the official pallbearers and there were over 1,000 people that showed up for that funeral in Washington and it was, it was quite an affair. Um, in 1977, my father started on his book and within a month of starting on his book, he had a massive stroke and lost the ability to speak. And you'll have to excuse men. Men, when they talk about their fathers, occasionally get emotional, so my apologies. Um, but in 1977, when he, after he had his stroke, he couldn't speak and couldn't use his right hand, so it looked like his book wouldn't get written. Until in 2010, I found his papers, and I found all 30,000 pages of his papers. Uh, in 1985, at his funeral, the uh, 106 Observation Squadron, the, the Air National Guard in Birmingham, flew out over the funeral in Phantom F-4 fighters, and the plane that pulled out in the missing man formation was a salute to the last of the men, of the three, three men on the flying trapeze. So thank you very much for <laughs> hoping you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. To, to prepare for this, I listened to uh, Winston Groom's presentation that he made, and he said, I love questions. So I love questions. So if anybody has any questions, he's going to have a, a mic back there, and he'd be glad, glad to give anybody the mic for a question. And I hope somebody's got a question. If you could raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Thanks so much for your presentation this evening. Just a real quick question. I, I sense that uh, the Flying Tigers were, for want of a better word, mercenaries. So I was just kind of curious uh, who's writing the check, if you will, and kind of what their motivation was. I, I sense they were uh, well, pa patriotic. Well, I would, I would uh, say that they were uh, employees of the uh, American government. Uh, through what I guess then was the OAS uh, and the person, Chenault didn't have very many allies in the United States except one and that was Franklin Delano Roosevelt and that was a pretty good ally to have and uh, Chenault went over and arranged with T.Y. Sung uh, who was the, Amer the Chinese ambassador to have new identities for these pilots and uh, the President of the United States wrote a letter for the recruiters to carry around to all the military bases, and when the generals said, there's no way you're going to get any of my pilots, they whipped out this letter from President Roosevelt, and they got whatever pilots they wanted. And they had different identities, and they were put on different ships, and a company called Camco uh, that was headed by Bill Pauley was in charge of getting them over here. And Bill Pauley and General Chenault really didn't like each other. And I suspect that President Roosevelt told Pauly and Chenault, the two of y'all for the sake of the war have got to learn to get together and get this worked out. And uh, so they were on the way over uh, on ships. They were all civilians. And my favorite story is they were all in a room and they were I think 99 at this point. They'd lost one airplane and one pilot. And they were all civilians. They were not in the military anymore. They had resigned. And Chenault walked in the room, walked in the building. They had no obligation to stand up at attention. And they just looked at Chenault's face, and every single one of these men stood up at attention. <laughs> That's the kind of face General Chenault had. And he didn't have to tell them about the planes that he shot down, because all they had to do, and Tex Hill is the one that made the comment, this is all I had to do is listen to what the general told me to do. It was quite obvious that he knew what the hell he was talking about. And if we followed the general's instructions, we were going to be fine. And I would make this other comment is there was another group of 100 P-40s that was sent to Australia. And the Australian pilots took the exact same planes that the American pilots had. And within three weeks, every one of them was shot down by the Japanese. 
and I don't know the exact number of planes that the ABG shot down, but what was the difference? There was only one difference, and that was General Chenault, and that was the tactics that he taught them. Where did he learn those tactics from? He learned those tactics from flying the Hawk 75 and observing McDonald's squadron uh, in combat over Nanking uh, against the Japanese. Um, so the American pilots had the same equipment that the Australians did. They simply were better trained, um, and they were wildly successful. And I will say one other thing that was interesting is that when the, the ABG was disbanded nine months later, they were completely exhausted. Their planes were, were beat up in terrible shape. And General Bissell came in and told them and said, tomorrow morning you will walk out that door and you will re-enlist at your prior ranks and there will be no exceptions. And if anybody doesn't re-enlist, uh, we will not lift one finger to get you back to the United States. And when he walked in the next day, uh, one of the gentlemen stood at attention and saluted General Bissell and told General Bissell, uh, blank you. And they walked out. And I think my father probably had a popsicle stand outside because he's hired 17 of the ABG pilots to fly for CNAC. Um, but the ABG uh, was uh, uh, an extraordinary group of pilots who performed unbelievable acts of heroism. Um, and it was all because of Chenault's tactics. And Chenault was a teacher. He went to LSU and he went to LSU normal school um, so that's that's what his background was. Um, any, anybody else have a question? Billy, we got a question from Dave who's online watching and he uh, wanted to know, you brought up LSU and obviously General Chenault's connection to our state. What connection do you have to Louisiana and is there a connection your father ever had here with the state? Uh, I went to Auburn. Uh, <laughs> So I've, I've learned to lose to lose LSU very graciously. Um, and I really don't have any family in Louisiana. Uh, we have gone down to see Nell Chenault, uh, who's actually Nell Calloway at the Chenault Museum on a, a number of occasions. Um, we went to the uh, air show at uh, uh, Lake Charles at the Chenault Field. Um, but don't have enough connections in Louisiana, and I feel like I now have one more. Thank you. Questions? Any, anybody Open. else? Oh, we'll go in the back, and then I'll make my way up to the front. Um, obviously, you said that uh, these men had resigned from the military, um, which I'm sure you know people had a lot of feelings about that. But is it documented that FDR had any documented feelings about the Flying Tigers? If it wasn't for FDR, there would be no Flying Tigers. Um, General Arnold was completely opposed to the Flying Tigers, as was, were most of the chief of, chiefs of staff. And the president frankly told General Arnold, I frankly, I really don't care. Um, here are your orders. This is what you're going to do. These are the pilots that you're going to give General Chenault. Um, and uh, if you've got the President of the United States on your side at that point, that's really all you need. And whether he actually wrote an executive order or not is in some question, but it was very clear that when the recruiters came by that they were speaking for the President of the United States when they said, we want whatever pilots or whatever mechanics you have to go to China. Anybody else? In the front here. Hi, uh, do you have any idea about how many times your father flew over the hump and if uh, the other two flying tigers also joined him? I know that he trained a lot of the flying tigers to fly over the hump and flew training missions over the hump. I know that the, the CNAC flew 38,000 flights over the hump. They carried 114,000 tons of cargo over the hump and it's not the American Transport Command. Um, and uh, I will tell this one story very briefly. Uh, Eddie Rickenbacker was sent by the President of the United States to uh, China to find out why is the American Transport Command losing so many planes and why is China National Aviation Corporation losing so few planes. 
why does CNAC carry more cargo than the same plane flown by an American pilot uh, of the ATC? And who do you think Rickenbacker went to see? Well, he went to see McDonald, who was, uh, who was then assistant chief pilot with CNAC and an old friend. And he uh, got his pilots around him, and he asked his pilots, he said, how many hours do you have as a pilot? And he said, well, I've got 10,000 hours. And he said, well, how many do you have? And he said, well, I've got 15,000 hours. And he said, well, how many do you have? And he said, well, I've got 12,000 hours. And that's a lot of hours as a pilot. And he asked uh, Rickenbacker, he said, how many does the average ATC new pilot have when he comes from the United States? He said, 150 hours. And you're going to fly him over the Himalayas and expect him to make it? Um, so you better upgrade the quality of pilots or the number of hours that they've flown. That was the one thing. The other thing he told Rickenbacker was that you are trying to treat the ATC as a military outfit, and you can't do that. You've got to fly over the hump as a civilian outfit, and there's certain techniques to flying over the hump as a civilian operation as opposed to a military operation. So Rickenbacker goes back and tells that to Roosevelt, and they fire the general who's in charge of the ATC, and they hire General Bill Turner. And Turner's written a terrific book on how he changed the ATC into a civilian operation. It was still military, but the procedures were civilian procedures. And they very quickly passed CNAC and just did an incredible job the last three years. And it was those procedures that were used in the Berlin airlift. Anybody else? We had a question up front right here. You mentioned that uh, they flew, when they were flying over the hump, they flew gasoline and gunpowder, I believe you said? Yes. And on the way back, they flew tungsten? Yes. I was wondering what, what was the significance of tungsten? Was it crucial to the war effort in any way? No, tungsten was what China had to sell. It was one of the resources that it could sell in India uh, and exchange it for more gasoline and more gunpowder. It was just, and, and their bases were where they landed were close to where these tungsten mines were located. Um, so that was, and it had a, another funny name, which I can't remember. Um, pardon? Yes, Wolfram was what it was called. Um, but it's all they had to change. They didn't have anything else. Um, so that's where it came from. Yes, sir. Another question online. Was there anything that was left out of the book? It's a two-part question. One, because you wanted to keep family discretion taken care of, or two, because it just couldn't make it in the book and had to be edited out? Well, my editor wanted to do, the original manuscript was 1,500 pages, and she read it and said, you really did make a D in freshman English your senior year at Auburn, didn't you? And I said, I certainly did. Um, and she wanted to do two volumes. And I said, well, I hate to break it to you, but I'm the guy writing the check, and you're going to do one volume. And you're supposed to be a hotshot editor, so start editing. And I don't care what you cut out, but there's going to be one volume. And I think she did a hell of a job. And nothing that, was, uh, that you found in the correspondence or the personal notes that you thought was a little too sensitive that you wanted to keep within the family? No, we, we fortunately didn't find anything bad about Daddy or anything bad about his pilots. They were, uh, they were a wild bunch of people. Um, and every time you took off and flew over the hump, you didn't know whether you were going to make it to the other side because you didn't know what was in the middle. You might run across 200-mile-an-hour winds. You might run across 100-mile-an-hour winds. Um, but it was, it was only 500 miles, but it was unbelievably dangerous flying over the hump. We got time for one last question, and it's up. Oh, we'll get two questions for you. First to your right, Billy. Okay. I just want to thank your dad and his fellow pilots for getting my dad over that hump safe. Right. Well, you're more than welcome. And the last question right here in the center. Just a quick question. Did you go to China as part of your research for the book, or did you just use your father's notes and your own research? I did. I was invited to China in 2016 by eight museums in China. Uh, I presented the book to museums in uh, Nanking, Beijing, and Kunming, and I presented them copies of my father's uh, command wings, which he was given by the Chinese Air Force. Uh, and it was really 
kind of extraordinary to go into communist China. I was a little nervous about going. But when you walk into a museum and there's a life-size picture of Chenault and my father, and at the bottom I said, what does that say in Chinese? He said, these are the Americans that came over and saved our bacon. Um, so it's kind of hard to dislike those people, and I like the people that I met in China a great deal. Uh, Billy, I said one last question, but I've got one sure. last comment back here from one of our uh, founding board members, I believe, Miss Virginia Weinman. She wanted to say something real quick. Well, when I was a child, my uncle uh, flew the hump in doing the transport, and when he came back, he brought me a little purse, maybe eight inches across and four inches wide, that was black velvet embroidered in silver thread of a peacock. And it had blue and green and various colors in it to, to decorate it. And I still have it today in the same box, in the same wrapping paper, which is black, to protect the, the uh, silver threads. And they're still silver. <laughs> well, those Thanks. things are very valuable. You so need to hang on to that. Great. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you all, all very much. Thank you, sir. Did you have a question? You got one question right here in front. I want to uh, shut off questions here. Uh, one of our uh, early supporters was Senator Ted Kennedy, who I think flew over the hump uh, uh, many times in World War II. Uh, did you run into anything about Senator Kennedy? I did not. I did not find Senator Kennedy's name in any of my papers. I'm sorry. I meant Senator Stevens. I, Ted I, Stevens. I do Different not part. recall seeing Senator St Stevens' name. Yeah, Senator Stevens and Senator Inouye were instrumental in building this building, but also getting the museum, the national designation, right. as America's National World War II Museum. And right. he, he served in the CBI and flew the hump, so he's obviously got a special place in our heart. Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a story. That, that story especially is not told about the aluminum trail, and uh, we're glad to be able to have you to share some of it with us tonight. And thank, thank you, you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, just, uh, Auburn, Auburn. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Billy, for, for sharing that, that fascinating and very personal story. You're not the only person who sometimes has a hard time talking about his dad without tearing up. I'm, I'm definitely in that crowd with you. But I've got to say this. Your mother is a lady after my own heart. <laughs> so, that's a great photo you showed us. Well, I strongly encourage you all to come back to the museum to revisit our arsenal of democracy and Road to Tokyo exhibits and maybe see them with a little bit different eyes. And we also hope to see um, many of you here next Thursday for the grand opening of our special exhibition, The Pelican State Goes to War. You're an honorary citizen of Louisiana now, Billy, so I hope you can come and see that too. Now, uh, as is our custom, Billy will be signing copies of the Shadow Tiger over here on the table to my left. So be sure to get a copy and come over and get, get his John Hancock on it. And on your way out, we invite you to, as always, stay for a bite to eat or one last drink or two at the American sector, which is going to be happy to take care of you. So thanks uh, for, to you all for once again being here. And please join me in thanking tonight's speaker, Billy McDonald. Good night from the museum. <laughs>